Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Jamie Tyberg. I'm the membership coordinator. And after the program, if you'd like to join the Korea Society, uh, please find me and I'd be happy to assist you. Um, now, please allow me to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Dr. Michael Shin uh, is a lecturer in Korean studies at the University of Cambridge. Uh, his research focuses on the Japanese colonial period of Korean history, and he has published many articles on the intellectual, literary, and social history of the early 20th century. Um, before that, he earned his bachelor's at Harvard. Um, he also spent two years in Seoul um, studying Korean. And he received his master's at Berkeley and his PhD from Chicago. And from 2001, he taught in the Department of Asian Studies at Cornell. And then he moved to Cambridge in the fall of 2008. So please um, welcome Dr. Shin to the stage. Okay, uh, thank you for coming here today. Um, I, I've been asked to talk about uh, my recent book, The Korean History and Maps. Now, you know, it's an atlas, it's a basic atlas. And the objective of the atlas was simply to create an atlas with all the basic maps necessary to understand Korean history. Now, there are ones for Chinese history and, and Japanese history. So I wanted to create one for Korean studies. You know, at, you know, so it can be used in classes at the undergraduate level. However, we also wanted to produce a different type of atlas. I mean, atlases for China and Japan were created you know, decades ago, you know, in the late 1960s in the case of Chinese history, in the late 1980s in the case of Japanese history. So we wanted to create an atlas suitable for use in the 21st century. So this meant creating an atlas with not just maps, but also all the basic information you need to study Korean history. Uh, there's lots of information now on the internet about Korea, Korean history, but we want to gather it all together in one place, but also reliable information. Why is it necessary? If you've ever studied something like the North Korean nuclear issue, sometimes they identify sites in it by the Uri, Uri's village. Right? So they say something is in, this site is in something something Uri in North Korea, and they identify on the map, it's wrong. The location is wrong. Why? Because villages' um, names are not unique. Like every single county or every province could have a village with the same name. It's like saying it's in Main Street. Doesn't make sense. So we would provide accurate, reliable data if you study Korean history. So first, I'll talk about some of the aspects of this atl atlas. Which, you know, which some of you have already bought, and then discuss some aspects of the, pr of the production of the book that might be worth knowing. And third, I'll discuss certain historical controversies about Korean history and, and sort of our position on that. Now, now the book is similar to existing atlases. You know, it covers every major polity that existed on the Korean Peninsula. So it has a map. Each section begins with a map of the whole country. And in cases where it's relevant, there's a map of the capital city. Then we move on to maps on specific topics, such as trade and wars. So there's a map of every you know, major war that occurred on the Korean Peninsula. But then uh, where it becomes different is the inclusion of material other than maps that seek to provide this basic information on Korean history. So each section has an overview of the politics, economy, society, and culture of each period. Right? We structured this way to make it easier to read, but also so you can see the patterns, all, you know, how certain things developed from prehistory to the present. Now, at the end of each section, there is a chronology of major events, as you can see here. Then in periods where sufficient data is available, there are statistical tables of basic indices, such as population, and lists of monarchs and rulers of each polity. Another way in which the atlas is unique is the inclusion of many visual images of Korean history. So each section contains photographs of major historical sites. We felt this was very important since, you know, you know the quote unquote average American or Westerner that does not generally have a strong visual uh, image of Korea in general. 
I mean, yes, if you talk about Japanese history, you think of the samurai. If you talk about Chinese history, maybe you think of the first emperor, terracotta warriors, etc. But if you say Korean history, you know, what do you think about? So far, <laughs> basically, this is the only strong image of Korea. Because if you think about it, even things that were set in Korea, people would say, oh, it doesn't really tell us anything about Korea. It's about something else. Like MASH. They said, oh, MASH is not really about Korea. It's about Vietnam. So yeah, Korea couldn't win. Uh, even things set in Korea are not about Korea. Psy was actually the turning point. For, for the first time, I noticed that, that something came out of Korea and they said, oh, what can this teach us about Korea? Now, so each section begins with the image of you know, famous leaders or, their, or the, their most important leaders of the country. So this is Joseon. So we have pictures of you know, Tejo, the first king of Joseon, and Yongjo, the one who was the, lo the longest ruler, considered one, again, one of the greatest kings. Now, in some sections, we dedicated pages to a specific cultural site or artifact. So in the case of later Shilla, we have a diagram explaining Bulguk Temple, Bulgusa. I mean, I'm sure many of you have visited there. If you were raised in South Korea, you all did a school trip there at some point. Yeah. Yeah. But we didn't, just didn't want to show it to you. We want to you know, explain it in a way that makes the history come alive. And one thing that's interesting about Bulguksa is that you should be, you could be blindfolded and just taken there. And then when the blindfold is removed, you should be able to immediately know where you are. It's so distinctive. Right? And so we tried to explain what, what are those aspects that immediately identify it as Korean. It can only be in Korean. Right? First is that on the right, you see the two different stupa. Right? They're different. And there's a purpose to that. And we explained that this is actually um, done deliberately because it comes out of a certain passage in the Lotus Sutra. They represent the conversation between two Buddhas that occurred in the Lotus Sutra. So we explain this here. The other thing that makes it distinctive is it's one of the very rare temples that's divided into compounds, clearly divided into compounds. Each compound represents a different part of the Buddhist worldview. Right? Each compound is dedicated to a specific Buddha or figure in the Buddhist worldview and a specific sutra. So we explain all this. Oh, yeah, so we have a section on Celadon pottery. Explain how it's produced, where it was produced. Then we have a uh, section on Yongbok Palace. As you can see, we picked the things where a Westerner would most likely to know about or would most likely see if they visit Korea. But we tried to take it one step forward further. We tried to explain, not, not just show that it's beautiful, but explain it in its historical context. So here, we try to explain you know, the structure of the palace, well, that makes sense, but also why it's located where it is. Right? If you notice that any, almost any palace in East Asia will have a similar location. It's called, in Korean, it's called Dra Myo Usa, which means that, again, the, king, the monarch in Chinese cosmology is viewed as ruling while looking to the south. So all palaces look toward the south. The Gyeongbok Palace is not perfectly southern oriented for a specific region because it followed the principles of feng shui. It's oriented that way. But that means if the king is looking south, uh, the shrine to the ancestors must be on the left, zhua myo. Then usa on the right must be the altar to the gods of the grains, et cetera, where you do perform the you know, grain ceremonies. Another principle is uh, that government offices must be in the front of the palace. Markets must be in the back. Why? Because, again, they didn't value merchants, mercantile activity. So the activities of merchants should not block the monarch's view of the south. So put it in the back. So you notice Chinese capitals are structured that way. But if you notice that Zhongno in, in Seoul, where the, where the stores are, are actually in front. Okay? This is feng shui. Because feng shui, they put the mountain in the back. That left no room for the markets. So they put it behind the government offices. The other principle is Sammun Samjo, or three gates. If you've ever been to, if you've been to both the Forbidden Palace in China and the palace and palaces in Korea, you'll notice a strong difference. And how many gates does it take to reach the throne? 
Does anyone know if anyone been to Beijing, counted the number of gates you have to pass through to reach the throne? It's many. Yeah, many. It's five. The principle is five. In Korea, they allowed them to have three. Korea couldn't have five because it's not China. So they said three. So there are three gates that lead to it. So we, we, we indicated here. You see that? The original structure meant three gates passed before you reached the king. Now, I'm going to say a few words about, uh, uh, this is a reflection of our approach to the atlas. And this sort of emerged from a sense of dissatisfaction in the way issues related to Korean geography are being discussed in the media and how Korean studies is being promoted abroad. I mean, we were certainly aware that a lot of issues of Korean historical geography are causes of political conflict in East Asia. Right? You've heard about many of them, you know, Dokdo issue, the East Sea, Sea of Japan issue, etc. But we did not want to make them the focus of the book. And the reason is simple. To us, these issues are not academic in nature. These are political conflicts that are being played out through history. So I don't see how addressing these debates would necessarily pro help to promote Korean studies. Rather, we, we, would focus, we wanted to focus on shifting the terms of the debate. And th this sort of represents what we were reacting against. I see this, and I cannot help but just shake my head. It's not that I disagree with the sentiment, but I disagree with how they're going about promoting it. How many conversations go on when you start about, you don't know this? You're already telling people, you're ignorant. You should know this. How many people like being told what, what, what position to take on an issue? My children don't like me to tell them how to think. My students don't like me to tell them what to think. What's more important is, you give them the material to form opinions on their own. Right? An ad like this in the New York Times costs $50,000 each time it's in there. I have much better uses of $50,000 than, than this. I mean, the question is, I, I would imagine, like, how would a, you know, average American reader who doesn't know anything about, you know, much about East Asia react to this? I mean, they must think, why should they bother to be interested in this is the issue. And I think that's what Korean studies should focus on. So instead of taking, uh, this is, to me is a very defensive attitude. Korea must protect its own version of history. But I thought through this atlas, we wanted to take a different issue. We, were to, we wanted to be more concerned about sharing Korean history, sharing with those who don't know it, lowering the barrier that it, it takes to learn about Korean history. And we're hoping that this book will make it much easier for anyone who has even the slightest interest in Korean history to learn about it. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, generally, I don't think I should care about what views they eventually you know, adopt regarding Korean history. It's not my job. My job is to stimulate their thought, stimulate their interest, and then engage with them as they develop their own views on the subject. Right. Now, let me say a few words about the, the production of the atlas. You know, you know, as you would guess, the making of an atlas is a, you know, a once-in-a-generation uh, opportunity. I mean, the fact that you know, the, an atlas used in Chinese studies was made in the 1960s show that, again, it's hard to make one. You, can't, you don't have this opportunity often. You know, part of it is the time required to learn about you know, so many different periods of history, but part of it is also the money. I mean, making an atlas is expensive. Uh, I don't think I will ever work on a more expensive book than this. This took a lot of money. So this book would not have been possible without a grant. And we've received a grant from the Academy of, South, of Korean Studies in South Korea. They gave us a three-year grant uh, unfortunately, the atlas took five years to produce. Right? Why? There are many reasons for this. Uh, first, I mistakenly thought that the basic maps for Korean history would already exist, at least within Korea. Because you know, ge these geographical issues have been a, you know, an issue of such political conflict. I thought, surely they must have produced these maps. But they hadn't. Um, I thought it would be sufficient to just take those maps and correct them, but instead, we had to work from scratch and create a lots of maps on our own. In fact, the first atlas of Korean history within Korea did not come out until the year 2004. And the English translation came out in 2008, the, actually the very year I was preparing this grant. And there were many aspects of that atlas that we felt were unsuitable for students in English-speaking countries, because it was an atlas produced for Korean students. Now, Another issue was that many existing maps were full of errors. 
Right? I've already mentioned that, you know, a lot of how a lot of North Korean maps are uh, erroneous. And it's true of lo a lot of periods of history. You know, we looked at, you know, in preparation, we looked at lots of history textbooks published in South Korea, especially textbooks used in colleges. These are not generally available to the public because because of internet technology, desktop publishing, each major university can produce its own textbook of Korean history for its students. But we dis quickly discovered that the textbooks were all, the maps in them were different. Showing the, the, the same information would be different in these maps. So we had to uh, go back and produce maps ourselves, check the data. Um, colleagues actually in South Korea advised us to look at high school textbooks. They said that they're superior to college textbooks because high school textbooks are updated more frequently and they're uh, inspected more frequently. So the data has to be accurate in those maps. And they were indeed quite helpful. Another thing that took a long time was the way we worked with the, the designer of the book. And I, you know, I'm very, every time I have a chance to talk about the book, I want to thank our designer, uh, Gang Jun Mo. Uh, for all the work he did on this. I mean, you know, the usual way of working on an academic book would be to prepare all the text, all the data, just give it to the designer, the designer works on it, the book gets published. But our relationship with the designer was much more collaborative than would be the case with a typical academic book. He was involved from the very beginning, engaged, engaging us in discussion on the, you know, the look and design of the book. This was necessary because uh, it's sort of embarrassing to admit, but most historians don't think well geographically. Uh, we're generally not trained to think about his history in geographic terms. Uh, I, I, you know, I was that way as well. I, mean, I learned a tremendous amount about geography through this book. So it was necessary for him to talk to us about, about visual aspects, how, you know, think about which maps need to be produced and how to enhance the other information in the atlas. He was always pushing us to think about what's the most efficient way visually to present data on Korean history. So as a result of his suggestions, the length of the book doubled. We originally planned it to be less than 100 pages. The book is now exactly 200 pages in length. Now, as an indication of how difficult this book was to produce, the designer produced 50 drafts of it before we finished, which is an incredible amount of work. Uh, we paid the designer a good amount of money, but if we broke it down in terms of you know, amount he was paid per hour, it'd be very depressing. And this is how we worked with the authors as well. We constantly had to discuss it. Um, involved a tremendous amount of discussion so that you know, our conception of Korean history would be consistent and also to reduce errors as much as possible. And I hope that you know, all this effort is reflected in the final product. Now, let me get to the historical controversies and again. I think actually that term historical controversies is actually wrong because they're not actually academic controversies. As I mentioned, they're really political conflicts that are just using history as the backdrop. But let me discuss these in more detail since they have indeed made the news. Now, there are many aspects of Korean history that have caused friction with uh, China and Japan, but they generally fall into two periods. You know, the quote unquote ancient period in the modern period. Now, in the West, you've probably most heard about controversies on modern history, because these are reported in the press, they're relatively well known. But, you know, such as the comfort women issue, or the Dokdo, you know, Dok Island issue. But in East Asia, e a ancient history is just as politicized as modern history. You know, um, and controversies on the modern period are generally not directly related to geography, you know, with the big exception, of course, of the Dokdo, Dok Island issue. By contrast, controversies on the ancient period often involve geography. So we had to address that more directly. And so the ancient period, this book was by far the hardest section to produce. It may not look that way, but it, it just it took a disproportionate amount of time compared to other sections. We had to check over and over again. So for each polity, so for in the like Goguryeo section, we checked with a Goguryeo specialist. Section on Balhe, we went to the world's leading expert in, on Balhe to check on, and just involved a tremendous amount of time. But these are generally less well known in the West because they, they generally involve conflicts with China rather than Japan. Now, what is meant by ancient? 
the term ancient. It roughly corresponds to the Three Kingdoms period. And also the first kingdom as well, Joseon. But some controversies extend to the next period as well. But it generally begins with the formation of kingdoms in, you know, in the early first millennium and up to Shilla's victories in the wars against Baekje and Goguryeo in the mid-7th century. <laughs> now, the Koreans, of course, this is the story of the wars among the three kingdoms, uh, leading to uh, you know, a distinct, uh, you know, what some scholars believe is a unified Shilla period. To scholars, it is also the time of the formation of Korean civilization. Right? There's clear evidence that uh, the culture of the three kingdoms was becoming closer at this time. Like if, they, if envoys from the three kingdoms went to China, they could translate for each other in this period. And the culture, the clothing was becoming similar enough that spy, identifying spies did become a problem. Like historical sources clearly indicate this. That why is this period so controversial? It's mainly because of the Chinese government's effort to appropriate certain ancient kingdoms as part of Chinese history and de denying that they are Korean. So beginning in the 1990s, the Chinese government launched a large scale project to undertake research on East Asian history. Then in the year 2002, it officially launched what has the long Chinese character name you see here. If you had a literal translation, it's that second line, Northeast Borderland History and Chain of Events Research Project, but generally known as the Northeast Project. And it was handled by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and the level of funding is absurd for historians. Right? $2.4 billion. Now, I cannot get people to donate $2.4 million to Cambridge to support our activities, but the Chinese government gave this level of funding to study this. That shows uh, how important they viewed this. Yeah. Now, the result of this has been to politicize ancient history to an extent out of proportion to its importance. Question is why? Uh, I mean, I'm not a China expert, but uh, Korean scholars suspect that this has to do with Chinese domestic political situation and the leadership's anxieties about political unrest. And specifically related to Korea, they're afraid that if Korea reunifies, the Korean autonomous region in Manchuria, known as Yanbyeon or Yanbyeon, will want to rejoin, will want to join the unified country. So they want to eliminate any possible claims Korea has to land north of the Yalu River. Now, I showed here earlier, this is a list of some of the controversial aspects of ancient history, and, and I'm going to go over them one by one. One is the first, probably the biggest issue is what's known as the Han commanderies. Now, now what there is, the first Korean kingdom was called Joseon. It's now known as Gojoseon or Old Joseon. And this is one where the Korean mythical founder, Dangun, established, right? The son of heaven came down to Bekdusan, you know, married, married the bear woman, and gave birth to Dangun, who was named the first king of the Korean polity. Right? And this kingdom was eventually conquered by Han, Han China. Now, the controversy is over what happened next. Now, surviving records make it clear that Han China then established what it called four, uh, four commanderies in the region. And the debate is over where they were located. I mean, they use place names that don't exist today. So we're not perfectly sure where they are. This map shows a good, uh, is a good summary of the difference between this, the Korean position and the Chinese position. The Chinese position is on the left, clearly showing the, all four commanderies within the Korean peninsula. The Korean government's position, South Korea and others, is that all four are outside of the Korean peninsula. Now, in the book, we follow the consensus of South Korean scholars on this, which differs from both official positions. Now, this is a more extreme version of, this, of the Chinese view. It shows the command is going really deep in the Korean peninsula. But this is our map. South Korean scholars, you know, based on both textual and archaeological evidence, acknowledge that the, that the commanderies were in the Korean peninsula. 
not all of them were. As you can tell, Zhuantu was at, some time, at times in history north of the Yalu River. And they were also smaller than Chinese scholars have claimed. Now, this issue does not resonate with the general public in the way that you know, Japanese colonialism does. But the government is extremely sensitive about this, especially the current administration. Now, there's something called the Early Career Project at Harvard University. And it has received funding from a governmental foundation called the Northeast Asian History Foundation. And it made the news this past spring because um, they published a book, I think maybe two years ago or three years ago, that had a map that showed something similar to this, that the commanders were in the Korean Peninsula. Then when their projects were reviewed by the government, they became uh, very upset at this, and they cut off the funding. So they cut off the funding to Harvard University for this project. So again, this is taken very seriously, very seriously in Korea. Now, this issue is, cl uh, is closely related to a second point of contention between both Koreas and China. And that's China's claim that Goguryeo, the nor most northern of the three kingdoms, was not a Korean kingdom, but was actually Chinese. It's a particular focus of, of China since, uh, sorry, I don't have a map of this, but it's Goguryeo's territory was mainly in Manchuria. Now, their argument is that, it has several parts, but one major claim is that Xuantu, the Khan commander Xuantu, developed into Goguryeo. So they're saying that Goguryeo had a Chinese origin. But our map show, suggests that this, you know, shows that this is very unlikely. The reason why Xuantu is shaped in, unusually is that in historical records, it mainly appears uh, in, in references to trading stations. So it looks like they were just military outposts along trading route. That's why it's sort of shaped that way. It looks like a trading route between Korea and China. Right? So the South Korean view, and, and also North Korean view, and gen generally most scholarly view, is that Goguryeo developed in the area of Xuan to eventually, eventually conquered it and drove out all the rest of the Han commanderies as well. And at least in the first decade of this century, uh, Beijing University still taught Goguryeo as part of Korean history. So historians even within China were not following this position. And most historians, you know, do, you know, regardless of the country, do follow this, this position. But this is, uh, this hasn't stopped China from advancing these views. Just to go over a few of the other claims. Uh, they claim that Goguryeo kings accepted investiture from the Chinese ruler. Uh, you know, they would do so, but it's pretty clear that uh, at this time, the Chinese world order didn't really exist. It didn't really exist until the Ming period. At this period, you know, Goguryeo kings and later we'll see other kings saw themselves as the son of heaven as well. It was not only the Chinese king that saw himself as the son of heaven. They claimed that uh, you know, officials in Goguryeo accepted seals from the Chinese from the from the Chinese emperor. Chinese emperor. But when we when scholars looked into this research and this claim, we found out that they only discovered five seals in the entirety of that period. It doesn't seem like a very strong argument. Then they also claimed that when Goguryeo fell, most of the refugees went to Tang China, again showing that they were more Chinese in nature. But this has not been proved. But this is continuing to cause problems today, right, in, a, in, a histor in a more political sense. Uh, because Goguryeo was located in Manchuria, so lots of its you know, artifacts and historical sites are still there. But as you know, since the 1990s, East Asia has been trying to um, list many of its sites in the, the UNESCO World Heritage list. But China is trying to apply for this as Chinese sites much to the consternation of North Korea. Because you know, North Korea has no friends on the international stage. No one is helping them with this case. But uh, certain important uh, document, uh, monuments, like King Gwangetto, is the most famous king from the Goguryeo, Goguryeo period. Right? He has a big stella located you know, on the Chinese side of the border. 
but the Chinese have now covered it up in a pavilion, and they've refused to allow Korean television companies to, sh to shoot it, because they want to claim it as Chinese. Now, China has made similar claims about a later kingdom. Again, if you know the history of the three kingdoms, after Shilla conquered the other two kingdoms, it formed a state that controlled the, the southern and central parts of the peninsula. But another kingdom emerged whose territory covered the northern part of the peninsula, as well as much of Goguryeo's former territory in what's called Manchuria today. And it was a kingdom called Balhe. Those of you who know Soteji, you know, the group Soteji know that he once produced a song called Balhe Dul Gumgumya, right? Dreaming of Balhe. So why did he call it that? Because this was once known as the unified Shilla period. They thought that Shilla conquered the other two kingdoms, unified the peninsula, but it didn't really occupy the whole peninsula. So scholars now call it the northern and southern states period. So it sort of is an odd sort of parallel, or uncanny parallel to Korea today, a divided peninsula. So when Soteji wrote the song, Dreaming of Balhe, he's talking about his desire for reunification. So that's what Balhe has sort of come to, to mean for a whole new, new generation of people. <coughs> now, not much is known about Balhe, but it de definitely was multi-ethnic. You know, the population was not Korean. It was mainly composed of the Mohe people. The Mohe people are the predecessors of the Jurchen, who became the Manchus. But the ruling elite was mainly composed of Goguryeo refugee, refugees who were behind the founding of the state. But China claims it was actually Chinese. But it's fairly easy to refute China's claim. And one big clue is the name. As you see here, the name consists of two Chinese characters. You know, if you've studied Chinese history at all, you know that Chinese kingdoms are named with one character. Right? So that's because only Han Chinese could have one character name. Two character names for barbarians, non-Chinese states. Right? How do we know this? Because when Balhe was formed, it actually had a different name. It called itself the character at the bottom, which is pronounced Jin in Korean. But when they began to have diplomatic relations with China, China refused to recognize it. So they had to change the name to a two-character name. This shows that at the time, Chinese did not acknowledge it as Chinese, but as Korean, or non-Chinese, at least. So for us, there was no question of whether to uh, include Balhe in the book. Right? We always indicated, uh, we always wanted to include it. But if you look at the book, uh, unfortunately, I feel it's the book where, the section where we had the uh, least useful photographs. It's because most of the uh, artifacts and sites are in China. And we, we couldn't get the rights to these photographs. For instance, the um, crowns of Balhe kings have been found. And it would have been great if we had been able to use those photographs because the crowns are exactly the same as Goguryeo crowns. It shows this connection. But again, we were, we were able to show a picture of a site that shows what's interesting is Balhe site, village site, that has ondol flooring, that underground, un, you know, underfloor heating system, okay? because that came from Goguryeo. Yeah, it shows that connection. Now, in the ancient period, there is one point of con contention with Japan. And this is actually related to the colonial period. Right? And during the colonial period, Japan attempted to rewrite Korean history in a way that could justify its takeover of Korea. And, as part, and, and this effort was sort of to prove that Korea had always been dominated by foreign countries. So its natural state was a colony. So as part of this effort, they claimed that Gaia, a small confederation that existed during the Three Kingdoms period, was actually a Japanese colony in the peninsula. And you can see Gaia here. Now, it never formed a kingdom. It was a confederation. But why was it able to survive for so long? Because in that area, there's lots of iron. And they were uh, iron. And they were tremendously skilled at iron production. So iron swords produced by God can be found throughout the Korean Peninsula and throughout southern, China, southern Japan. And they were very advanced in their use of, of iron. Now, after Korea's liberation, this claim was refuted by both uh, Korean and Japanese scholars. I mean, it hasn't been taken seriously for decades. But 
earlier this year, the Japanese government put this claim up back on their website and began including this in, in textbooks, the government textbooks, which is strange. Right? Um, and there are problems with the term, and people think that, like, if you look at the Chinese character of Gaia and the Japanese term for it is Mimana, people just, some scholars speculate that the similarity of the Chinese characters just led to confusion in the early days. But another problem is the term that appears in the text itself, which is in pronounce the characters there for Mimana, or um, what's pronounced in Korean, Imna Ilbon Bu. There's a question of whether Japan, you know, the Ilbon, Nippon, and the characters that are used to represent Japan today really refer, refer to a polity at that time because it was actually a much later term than when Gaia existed on the Korean Peninsula. But what scholars have focused on instead is the last character, which I've highlighted in yellow, Bu, generally means government office. But it, what's strange about the, te the text where this term appears is that it's never used to refer to the normal functions of government, like such as levying taxes or raising armies. Instead, it's mostly associated with trade. So they feel that scholars have advanced their argument that the character um, here should not be pronounced, you know, who, but differently. We call it here, mikoto mochi, or I mean, person. So they think, they think this term refers to the Japanese representative in Gaia, it's effectively a trade representative. Right? So, you know, since serious scholars in both Japan and Korea don't, you know, you know don't advance this view, we felt no, we felt no obligation to address this in the book. So we just present. Gaia is one of the polities on the Korean Peninsula at the time. Now, I'm just br briefly some of this controversies on modern history. Now, of course, one of the issues that has been appearing frequently in the news is this, you know, the so-called comfort woman atrocity. And this is a, another illustration of what I mentioned earlier. This is a political controversy, not an academic one. Now, among scholars, there is little debate about this issue. It's clear that it was organized by the Japanese army, centrally organized. Right? It's clear that there was deception and coercion involved in the recruitment of women. Now, scholars acknowledge that we might not know the exact numbers involved, but Yoshimi Yoshiaki, the, you know, the, the Japanese scholar who did the pioneering research on this issue, estimates that there were at least 50,000 women who were mobilized. But he acknowledges that up to 200,000 would be a reasonable estimate as well. We just, we just can't know. Right? He, in fact, he even speculates that a higher number would be possible if turnover was higher, higher than expected. Right? So again, there, really, there is scholarly consensus on this issue. So we actually included a map of this in the body of the book. Right? We generally put um, sections on historical controversies in the appendix. But for this, there, is, there really is no scholarly controversy. So it's in the main part of the book. Dokdo is a whole other level of problem. Uh, now, it, it became problematic in the early 20th century. And some of you might know, in 1905, it was annexed by Shimane Prefecture. And, you know, not by Japan, the country, but by the pre prefecture. Right? So why is this significant? It's the first part of Korean territory, at least from the Korean perspective, that was annexed by Japan. So it became very sensitive. And in the post-war era, Japan tried to maintain it as its territory. So um, in the negotiations for the San Francisco Peace Treaty, if you, the scholars have looked over the drafts of this. You know, if you look at the drafts, you can see this battle where Japan keeps on trying to put it in. You know, the, the Japanese name for it is Takeshima, which is ridiculous. And Take is bamboo. Of course, there's, bamboo doesn't exist on this island. Right? But they called it Takeshima. Right? Then, the Allies kept on taking it out. And in the final draft of the San Francisco Peace Treaty, of course, it, is, it doesn't exist. You know, it's not in there. It's not mentioned. And it doesn't clearly state that it's no longer Japanese territory, but it's, not, it's clearly not included as Japanese territory in the San Francisco Peace Treaty. But this has become increasingly problematic after the end of the Cold War. 
you know, a very sensitive subject between the two, and stimulated tremendous amounts of research. Uh, there is a Dokdo Research Institute in South Korea. It's devoted to this issue. Lots of, and so they've done lots of research on old maps. And generally, cartographic evidence is on the side of Korea. If you look, this is a, actually a Japanese map that was discovered. And it actually states directly in character, not just, not just by the colors, but the character said, oh, it points to Takeshima and said, this is, this is Joseon land. This belongs to Joseon. At this time, this, so this got translated into Western maps. Why? A, this was produced in the you know, 1700s. A German cartographer was actually in Japan at the time of its publication. Then he went back and produced maps that reproduced this. But then <coughs> they do try to show that uh, it occurred earlier. We can see this earlier in Western maps as well. So this is a map from earlier in the same century. But you can see here, there's another island here. But it's strange because it's in the wrong location. <laughs> right? It should be further away from Ulungdo than is indicated in the map. But one explanation at the time is that, according, some, some people believe that according to cartographic conventions at the time of its production, uh, you try to show sovereignty by putting things close to the shore. So, so some, some scholars argue that, again, it's in its proper place, according to the conventions of its time. But again, th this is still being, being debated. Japan's uh, claims have to do mainly with the, ass the assignment of fishing rights to that era, to that area. But uh, one evidence they found in both Korean and Japanese sources is that one fisherman near the island uh, of Dok Island was captured by the Japanese. Then he was eventually returned to Korea. Then in this process of processing his return, there was acknowledgement that, again, he was returned because it is Korean territory. It belongs to Joseon. So this is the thing that South Korean government brings up all the time to assert its claim to this. In my view, it's not really a dispute. There's, there's no, other than Japan, there's no one else that contests Korea's sovereignty over Dokdo, or Dok Island. So we did include it. Uh, one problem is that it's not, at the scale of the maps in our, in our book, Dokdo should really only, should appear as very tiny dots. So it appears only very, a very small scale. Yeah. But we felt that it was proper to include it because again, at this point, South Korea's sovereignty over the island is not contested in the international, by the international community. And this is a, just a, a very sort of quick overview of historical controversies. But I hope to show that what we try to do is, in a way, sort of not really address it directly. We try to stick to academic consensus and just provide data that people could use to form opinions on their own. That's why we put an extensive uh, appendix about Dokdo in the book right, that showed different maps. I mean, this, hopefully this will stimulate people to explore maps on their own and formulate their own opinions about it. But inclusion, I just want to say a few, uh, a few things just I f how I feel about these issues and um, things I've learned about this. Right? Um, one thing that I feel strongly is that to assert that Dokdo is Korean or that the comfort women you know, existed is not to be anti-Japanese. Right? This should be obvious to most people, but I think it's, it's worth repeating because somehow the critics of this of the Korean positions constantly assert that they're anti-Japanese. And I don't think, this might be true of some ultra-nationalists in, in Korea, in, in China, but I don't think that's true of the majority of people. They're not being anti-Japanese. They might be anti-Abe, but, but, but they're not being anti-Japanese. In my case, whenever I go to Japan to look at archives, I'm treated with tremendous respect. I always have a good time and a productive time there. And they're very generous in sharing their, their resources with me. I have no problem with the Japanese scholars whom I know. You know we don't dis disagree about many of these fundamental issues. Right? Um, another s sign of this is the joint statement that have come out from both uh, Korean and J Japanese intellectuals. Right? In t 2010, at the, in the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the colonial period, uh, they produced a joint statement 
sort of declaring the annexation null and void. Right? To Korean scholars' tremendous surprise, uh, over 500 Japanese intellectuals signed it. Oe Kenzaburo signed it. Lots of prominent Japanese uh, historians signed it. And the reaction is tremendous. Then this year, with the anniversary of the end of World War II, they produced another statement that was released in, on August 15th, you know, the anniversary of Liberation Day, the end of World War II. Right? Many, many Korean and Japanese scholars are in unity on, this, on these issues. This is not a Korea versus Japan issue. Uh, another thing I've learned from this, something I, I think I would like to say more directly to the Korea society itself, which is that I think I learned about the importance of editors in this, right? and the importance of educating editors about these issues. Right? When I first uh, approached Cambridge University Press about this book, I didn't even get a, a, a reply. They were not interested in publishing about Korea. Then the top people retired, and the new regime came in. I, re I wrote them again, and they were very you know, interested in the book. Shows that, again, the, the editor's decision has tremendous uh, power over what, what information gets out there. But also, they are the people who eventually who decide on the proper way to write names, you know, whether it's East Sea or Sea of Japan. And they, they need to learn about these issues. Right? We, we, there's lots of funding out there. I know the Korea Society has lots of programs for educators, some for the general public. But I can't find any institution that has a program dedicated to editors at publishing houses that teaches them about East Asia. It just gets them to learn about this. And that would be one of the most effective ways to disseminate information about this. One, one example of this is the McGraw-Hill textbook controversy that some of you may be aware about. They have a world history textbook produced by two scholars that was recently protested by the Japanese government. They wrote, they wrote to the company McGraw-Hill, an you know, American publishing company, asking that uh, passages about the comfort women about the East Sea be changed. And what's funny is that in an interview with the author, he revealed that he had one of the, there's two authors, but one author revealed that he had no idea that East Sea was a controversial name. <laughs> know about this. That's to me suggests that the editor probably didn't know this was controversial. Right? I mean, the editors need to know about this so they can handle these matters properly. The last point I want to make is that there's this increasing disconnect in these issues between academia and politics. And this is a constant problem. I mean, academics will, will talk your ears off about how no one listens to them, and especially politicians. But it's particularly severe on these issues. And this is a reflection of a greater problem, which is the weakening of civil, civil society in both Korea and Japan. You know, civil society should be a, a restraint on governments should be free to criticize them and correct their positions. But this is gradually disappearing. Right? But somehow, I think, um, what I hope that this book can accomplish in a small part is to sort of to, you know, to revive this function. I don't think, if, if the scholars cannot serve this critical function, I think the general public must. So I think um, one duty of scholars is to get this information out to the general public as much as possible, you know, especially college students who are learning about these issues for the first time. So they can be educated properly about this and form opinions of their own and be part participate in these debates on these issues and not just let the governments monopolize the discussion. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I'll now take uh, any, any questions uh, you might have.